Sir Wilfred Roe, watch chambers. Oh, it's you, Charles. No, Sir Wilfred's in court. Won't be back just yet. Yes, the Shuttleworth case. What? With Myers for the prosecution and Banter trying it? He's been giving judgment for close on two hours already. Nah, not on earthly this evening. We're for that. Can give you an appointment tomorrow? No, nah, couldn't possibly. I'm expecting Mayhew of Mayhew and Briscoe any moment now. Well, so long. Shall I make the tea, Mr. Carter? It's hardly time yet, Greta. It is by my watch. Then your watch is wrong. I put it right by the radio. Then the radio must be wrong. Not the radio, Mr. Carter. That couldn't be wrong. This watch was my father's. It never gains nor loses. They don't make watches like that nowadays. Really, you're typing. Always mistakes. You've left out a word. Oh, well, just one word. Anyone might do that. The word you have left out is the word not. The omission of it entirely alters the sense. Oh, does it? <laughs> That's rather funny when you come to think of it. <laughs> it's not in the least bit funny. Do it again. You may remember I told you last week about the celebrated case of Bryant and Horsfall. A case of a will and a trust fund, and entirely owing to a bit of careless copying by a clerk. The wrong wife got the money. I remember. A woman divorced 15 years previously, completely contrary to the intention of the testator, as his lordship himself admitted. But the wording had to stand. They couldn't do a thing about it. I think that's rather funny too. <laughs> Council's chambers are no place to be funny in. The law, Greta, is a serious business and should be treated accordingly. Well, you wouldn't think so to hear some of the jokes that judges make. That kind of joke is the prerogative of the bench. And I'm always reading in the paper about laughter in the court. If that's not caused by one of the judge's remarks, you'll find he'll soon threaten to have the whole place cleared. Mean old thing. Do you know what I read the other day, Mr Carter? The law's an ass. I'm not being rude. It was a quotation. A quotation of a facetious nature not meant to be taken seriously. You can make the tea now, Greta. Oh, thank you, Mr. Carter. Mr. Mayhew of Mayhew and Brinsco will be here any moment now. And Mr. Leonard Bull is also expected. They may come together or separately. Leonard Bull? Why? That's the name. It was in the paper. The tea, Greta. Asked to communicate with the police because he might be able to give them some useful information. Tea! It was only last. The tea, Mr. Carter. These girls, sensational, inaccurate, I don't know what the temple's coming to. Mr. Mayhew. Good afternoon, Carter. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayhew. Sit down, Mr. Bowl. Sir Wilfred shouldn't be long, sir, although you never can tell with Mr. Justice Banter. I'll go straight over to the robing room and tell him you're here with? Uh, with Mr. Leonard Bowl, yes. Thank you, Carter. I'm afraid our appointment was at rather short notice. But in this case, time is uh, rather urgent. How's the lumbago? <laughs> I only feel it when the wind is in the east. But thank you for remembering, Mr. Mayhew. 
Uh, sit down, Mr. Vole. Thanks. I'd rather walk about. I... This sort of thing makes you feel a bit jumpy. Yes, yes, very probably. Would you care for a cup of tea, Mr. May? I've just made it. Thanks. Don't mind if I... No, thank you. Sorry. What I mean is, I can't believe it's me this is happening to. I keep thinking, perhaps it's all a dream and I'll wake up presently. Yes, I suppose one might feel like that. What I mean is, well, it seems so silly. Silly, Mr. Vole? Well, yes. I mean, I've always been a friendly sort of chap. Get on with people and all that. I mean, I'm not the sort of fellow who does, well, anything violent. But I suppose it will be all right, won't it? I mean, you don't get convicted for things you haven't done in this country, do you? Our English judicial system is, in my opinion, the finest in the world. Of course, there was that case of, what was his name, Adolf Beck. I read about it only the other day. After he'd been in prison for years, they found out it was another chap called Smith. They gave him a free pardon then. That's a thing that seems odd to me, giving you a pardon for something you haven't done. It is a necessary legal term. Well, it doesn't seem right to me. The important thing is that Beck was set at liberty. Yes, it's all right for him, but if it had been murder... Now, if it had been murder, it would have been too late. He would have been hanged. Now, Mr. Vole, there's no need to take a uh, morbid point of view. I'm sorry, sir, but you see, in a way, I'm rather getting the wind up. Yes, well, try and keep calm. Uh, Sir Wilfred Robarts will be here presently, and I want you to tell him your story exactly as you told it to me. Yes, sir. Uh, but in the meantime, perhaps we might fill out a little more of the background uh, details. Uh, you are at present, I understand, out of a job? Yes, but I've got a few pounds put by. It's not much, but if you can see your way to... Uh, oh, I'm not thinking of the legal fees. It's more the pictures I'm trying to get clear. Your surroundings and circumstances. Uh, how long have you been unemployed? Oh, about a couple of months. And what were you doing before that? I was in a motor servicing firm. Kind of mechanic, that's what I was. And how long had you worked there? About three months. Were you discharged? No, I quit. Had words with the foreman. Proper old... Uh, that is, he was a mean sort of chap. Always picking on you. And before that? I worked in a petrol station. Uh, but things got a bit awkward and I left. Awkward? In what way? Well, the boss's daughter. She was only a kid, but she took a... Uh, well, sort of fancy to me. There was nothing there shouldn't have been between us. But the old man got a bit fed up and said I'd better go. He was quite nice about it and gave me a good reference. Before that, I was selling egg beaters on commission. Indeed. And a rotten job they were too. I could have invented a better egg beater myself. You're thinking I'm a bit of a drifter, sir. But, well, it's true in a way, but I'm not really like that. Doing my army service unsettled me a bit. That and being abroad. I was in Germany. It was fine there. That's where I met my wife. She's an actress. But since I've come back to this country, I can't seem to settle down properly. I don't really know just what I want to do. Hello, John. Ah, Wilfred. Carter told you I was in court? Banter really surpassed himself. And this is uh, Mr. Vole? Uh, this is Leonard Vole. How do you do, sir? How do you do, Vole? Won't you sit down? How's the family, John? Molly's got a touch of this 24-hour flu. Oh, too bad. Yes, damn the ball. Did you win your case, Wilfred? Yes, I'm glad to say. It always gives you satisfaction to beat Myers, doesn't it? It gives me satisfaction to beat anyone. But especially Myers. Especially Myers. He's an irritating <clears throat> gentleman. He always seems to bring out the worst in me. That would appear to be mutual. You irritate him because you hardly ever let him finish a sentence. He irritates me because of that mannerism of his. It's this... <coughs> drives me to distraction. And he will call me Robarts. Robarts. But he's a very able advocate. If only he'd remember not to ask leading questions when he knows damn well he shouldn't. But uh, let's get down to business. Yes. I asked uh, Leonard Vole here because I'm anxious for you to hear his story exactly as he told it to me. There is some uh, <clears throat> urgency in the matter, it seems. Oh? 
My wife thinks I'm going to be arrested. She's much cleverer than I am, so she may be right. Arrested? For what? Well, for murder. It's the case of Miss Emily French. You may have seen the reports in the press. She was a maiden lady, living alone, uh, apart from an elderly housekeeper in a house at Hampstead. Uh, on the night of October the 14th, the housekeeper came home at 11pm uh, and found that her mistress had been coshed on the back of the head and killed. Uh, that is right? That's right. It's quite an ordinary sort of thing to happen nowadays. But then, the other day, the police said that they were anxious to interview a Mr. Leonard Vole, who had visited Miss French earlier on in the evening in question as they thought he might be able to provide them with some useful information. So, of course, I went along to the police station, and they asked me a lot of questions. Did they caution you? Well, I don't quite know. I mean, they said, would I like to make a statement, and they'd write it down, and it might be used in court. Is that cautioning me? Oh, well, it can't be helped now. Anyway, it sounded damn silly to me. I told them all I could. They were quite polite and seemed very satisfied and all that. When I got home and told Romaine about it, my wife that is, well, she got the wind up. She seemed to think that they, well, that they got hold of the idea that I might have done it. So I thought I'd better get hold of a solicitor. So I came along to you. I thought you'd be able to tell me what I ought to do about it. You knew Miss French well? Oh yes, she'd been frightfully kind to me. Actually, it was a bit of a bore sometimes. She positively fussed over me. But she meant it very well. And when I read in the paper that she'd been killed, I was awfully upset. Because, you see, I really got fond of her. Uh, tell Sir Wilfred, just as you told me, how it was you came to make Miss French's acquaintance. Well, it was one day in Oxford Street. I saw an old lady crossing the road carrying a lot of parcels. And in the middle of the street, she dropped them. She tried to get hold of them again and found that a bus was almost on top of her. I just managed to get her to the curb safely. Well, I recovered her parcels from the street, tied up one again that had burst open with string, wiped some of the mud off them, and generally sued the old dear down. You know the sort of thing. And she was grateful? Oh yes, she seemed very grateful. Thanked me a lot and all that. Anyone would think I'd saved her life instead of her parcels. There was actually no question of your having saved her life. Oh no, nothing heroic. Cigarette? No thanks, sir. Never do. Uh, but by an extraordinary coincidence, two days later I happened to be sitting behind her in the theatre. She looked round and recognised me and we began to talk. And in the end she asked me to come and see her. And you went? Yes. She'd urged me to name a day specially, and it seemed rather churlish to refuse. So I said I'd go on the following Saturday. And you went to her house at... Uh... Hampstead? Yes. What did you know about her when you first went to the house? Well, nothing really, other than what she'd told me. That she lived alone and hadn't very many friends. Something of that kind. She lived alone with only a housekeeper? That's right. She had eight cats, though. Eight of them. The house was beautifully furnished and all that, but it smelt a bit of cat. Had you reason to believe that she was well off? Well, she talked as though she was. And you? Yourself? Oh, I'm practically stony broke, and have been for a long time. Unfortunate. Yes, it is, rather. Oh, you mean people will say I was sucking up to her for her money? Well, I shouldn't have put it quite like that, but in essence, yes. That is possibly what people might say. It isn't really true, you know. As a matter of fact, I felt sorry for her. I thought she was lonely. I was brought up by an old aunt, my Aunt Betsy, and I like old ladies. You say, old ladies. Do you know what age Miss French was? Well, I didn't know, but I read about it in the paper and I found out she was 56. 56. You consider that old, Mr. Ball. But I should doubt if Miss Emily French considered herself old. But you can't call it a spring chicken, can you? Hmm. Well, let's get on. You went to visit Miss French fairly frequently? Yes, I should say once, twice a week, perhaps. Did you take your wife with you? No, no, I didn't. Why didn't you? Well, frankly, I don't think it would have gone down very well if I had. Do you mean with your wife or with Miss French? <laughs> oh, with Miss French. She, uh... Mm. Go on, go on. You see, she got rather fond of me. You mean she fell in love with you? Oh, good Lord, no, nothing of that kind. Just sort of pampered me and spoiled me, that sort of thing. 
You see, Mr. Vo, I have no doubt that part of the police case against you, if there is a case against you, which as yet we have no definite reason to suppose, will be why did you, young, good-looking, married man, devote so much of your time to an elderly lady with whom you could hardly have had very much in common? Yes, I know they'll say I was after her for her money. And in a way, perhaps, that's true. But only in a way. Well, at least you're frank, Mr. Vogue. Can you explain a little more clearly? Well, she made no secret of the fact that she was rolling in money. As I've told you, Romain and I, that's my wife, we're, we're pretty hard up. I'll admit that I did hope that if I was in really in a tight place, she'd lend me some money. I'm being honest about it. Did you ask her for a loan? No, I didn't. I mean, things were desperate. Of course, I can see it does look rather bad for me. Miss French knew that you were married. Oh, yes. But she didn't suggest you should bring your wife to see her. No, she... Well, she seemed to take it for granted that my wife and I didn't get on. Did you deliberately give her that impression? No, I didn't. Indeed, I didn't. But she seemed to, well, assume it. And I thought perhaps if I kept dragging Romaine into it, she'd, well, lose interest in me. I didn't exactly want to cadge money from her, but I'd invented this gadget for a car. A really good idea it is. And I thought perhaps if I could have persuaded her to finance that, I mean, it would have been her money and it might have brought her in a lot. Oh, it's really difficult to explain, but I wasn't sponging on her, Sir Wilfred. Really, I wasn't. What sums of money did you obtain at any time from Miss French? None. None at all. Tell me something about the housekeeper. Janet Mackenzie. She was a regular old tyrant, Janet was. Fairly bullied poor Miss French. Looked after her very well and all that. But the poor old dear couldn't call her soul her, soul her own when Janet was about. Janet didn't like me at all. Why didn't she like you? Oh, jealous, I expect. I don't think she liked my helping Miss French with her business affairs. Oh. So... You helped Miss French with her business affairs? Yes. She was worried about some of her investments and things, and she found it difficult to fill out forms and that sort of thing. <sighs> yes, I helped her with a lot of things like that. Now, Mr. Ball, I'm going to ask you a very serious question, and it's one to which it's vital I should have a truthful answer. You were in low water financially. You had the handling of this lady's affairs. Now, did you? at any time, convert to your own use the securities that you handle. Now wait a minute, Mr. Volk, because you see, there are two points of view. Either we can make a feature of your probity and honesty, or if you swindled the woman in any way, then we must take the line that you had no motive for murder, as you had already a profitable source of income. You can see that there are advantages in either point of view. What I want is the truth. Take your time, if you like, before you reply. I assure you, Sir Wilfred, I played dead straight, and you won't find anything to the contrary. Dead straight. Thank you, Mr. Vaux. You relieve my mind very much. I pay you the compliment of believing that you're far too intelligent to lie over such a vital matter. And now we come to October the... Uh, the 14th. 14th. Did Miss French ask you to go and see her that evening? No, she didn't, as a matter of fact. But I came across this kind of gadget and I thought she'd like it. So I slipped up there that evening and got there at about a quarter to eight. It was Janet Mackenzie's night out, and I knew she'd be alone and thought she might be rather lonely. It was Janet Mackenzie's night out, and you knew that fact? Oh yes, I knew Janet always went out on a Friday. That's not quite so good. Why not? It seems very natural that I should choose that evening to go and see her. Please, go on, Mr. Bell. Well, I got there at about a quarter to eight. She'd finished her supper, but we had a cup of coffee, and then we played a game of Double Demon. Then at nine o'clock, I said good night to her and went home. You told me that the housekeeper said that she came home that evening <sighs> earlier than usual. Yes, the police said she'd come back for something she'd forgotten, and she heard, or she says she heard, Somebody talking with Miss French. Well, whoever it was, it wasn't me. Can you prove that, Mr. Vaux? Yes, of course I can prove it. I was at home again with my wife by then. That's what the police kept asking me, where I was at 9.30. Well, I mean, some days one wouldn't know where one was. 
As it happens, I can remember quite well I'd gone straight home to remain, and we hadn't gone out again. You live in a flat? Yes, we've got a tiny flat over a shop behind Chalk Farm Underground Station. Did anyone see you returning to the flat? I don't suppose so. Why should they? It might be an advantage if they had. But surely you don't think... I mean, if she was really killed at half past nine, my wife's evidence is all I need, isn't it? And your wife will definitely say that you were home at that time? Of course she will. Uh, you are very fond of your wife, and your wife is very fond of you? Romaine is absolutely devoted to me. She's the most devoted wife any man could have. I see. You are happily married. Couldn't be happier. Romaine is wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. I'd like you to know her, Mr. Mayhew. Come in. The evening papers, Sir Wilfred. Thank you, Greta. Would you care for a cup of tea, sir? No, thank you, Greta. Oh, would you like a cup of all? No, thank you, sir. No, thank you. I think it would be advisable for us to have a meeting with your wife. You mean have a regular roundtable conference? I wonder, Mr. Vole, if you're taking this business quite seriously enough. I am. I am. Really. But it seems... I mean, it seems so much like a bad dream. I mean that it should be happening to me. Murder. It's a thing you read about in books or newspapers, but you can't believe it's a thing that could ever happen to you or touch you in any way. I suppose that's why I keep trying to make a joke of it. But it isn't a joke, really. No, I'm afraid it is not a joke. But, I mean, it's all right, isn't it? Because, I, I mean, if they think she was really killed at half past nine, and I was at home with Romaine... Uh, how did you go home? By bus or underground? I walked. It took me about uh, 25 minutes. It was a fine night, a bit windy. Uh, did you see anyone you knew on the way? No, but does it matter? I mean, Romaine... The evidence of a devoted wife, unsupported by any other evidence, may not be completely convincing, Mr. Vole. You... you mean they'd think Romaine would tell a lie on my account? It has been known, Mr. Vole. Oh, oh I I'm sure she would, too. Uh, only in this case, I mean, she won't be telling a lie. I mean, it really is so. You do believe me, don't you? Yes, I believe you, Mr. Vole. But it is not me you will have to convince. You are aware, are you not, that Miss French left a will leaving you all her money. Left all her money to me? You're joking. I'm not joking. It's in tonight's evening paper. <sighs> well, I can hardly believe it. You knew nothing about it? Absolutely nothing. She never said a word. You're quite sure of that, Mr. Bowen? Absolutely sure. I'm very grateful to her, yet, in a way, I rather wish now that she hadn't. I mean, it's a bit unfortunate as things are, isn't it, sir? It supplies you with a very adequate motive. That is, if you knew about it, which you say you didn't. Did Miss French ever talk to you about making a will? She said to Janet once, you're afraid I shall make my will again. But that was nothing to do with me. I mean, it was just a bit of a dust-up between them. Do you really think they're going to arrest me? I think you must prepare yourself, Mr. Vole, for that eventuality. You... You will do the best you can for me, won't you, sir? You may rest assured, my dear Mr. Vole, that I will do everything in my power to help you. Don't worry. Leave everything in my hands. You look after Romaine, won't you? I mean, she'll be in an awful state. It'll be terrible for her. Don't worry, my boy. Don't worry. Then there's the money side, too. That worries me. I've got a few quid, but it's not much. Perhaps I ought not to have asked you to do anything for me. I'm sure we shall be able to put up adequate defence. The court provides for these cases, you know. I can't believe it. I can't believe that I, Leonard Vole, may be standing in a dock saying not guilty. People staring at me. I can't see why they don't think it was a burglar. I mean, apparently the window was forced and smashed, and a lot of things were strewn around. So the papers said. I mean, it seems much more probable. 
The police must have some very good reason for not thinking that it was a burglary. Well, it seems to me... Yes, Carter? Excuse me, Sir Wolford. There are two gentlemen here asking to see Mr. Vole. Policeman? Yes, sir. All right, John. I'll go and talk to them. My goodness. Is this it? I'm afraid it may be, my boy. Now, take it easy. Don't lose heart. Make no further statement. Leave it all to us. But how did they know I'm here? It seems probable that they've had a man watching you. Then they really do suspect me. Sorry to trouble you, sir. This is Mr. Ball. Your name is Leonard Ball? Yes. I am Detective Inspector Hearn. I have here a warrant for your arrest on the charge of murdering Miss Emily French on October the 14th last. I must warn you that anything you say may be taken down and used in evidence. Okay. I'm ready. Good afternoon, Hearn. My name is Mayhew. I'm representing Mr. Ball. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Mayhew. Then this is for you. That's quite all right. Good. We'll take him down and charge him now. Very seasonable weather we're having just now. Quite a nip of frost last night. I expect we'll be seeing you very soon, sir. I hope we haven't inconvenienced you, Sir Wilfred. I have never inconvenienced. <laughs> I must say, John, that that young man is in the worst mess than he seems to think. He certainly is. How does he strike you? Extraordinarily naive. Yet in some ways quite shrewd. Intelligent, I should say. But he certainly doesn't realise the danger of his position. Do you think he did it? I have no idea. On the whole, I should say not. You agree? I agree. Oh well, he seems to have impressed both of us favourably. I can't think why. I never heard a weaker story. God knows what we're going to do with it. The only evidence in his favour seems to be his wife's. And who's going to believe a wife? It has been known to happen. And she's a foreigner too. Nine out of twelve in the jury box believe a foreigner is lying anyway. She'll be emotional and upset. <laughs> Won't understand what the prosecuting counsel says to her. Still, we shall have to interview her. You'll see, she'll have hysterics all over my chambers. Perhaps you'd prefer not to accept the brief. Who says I won't accept it? Just because I point out that the boy has an absolute Tom Fool story to tell. But a true one. It must be true. It couldn't be so idiotic if it wasn't true. Put all the facts down in black and white. And the whole thing is utterly damning. And yet, when you talk to the boy and he work, blurts out these damning facts, you realise that the whole thing could happen just as he said. Damn it, I had the equivalent of an Aunt Betsy myself. I loved her dearly. He's got a good personality, I think. Sympathetic. Yes, should go down well with the jury. That cuts no ice with the judge, though. And he's a simple sort of chap who might get rattled easily in the box. A lot depends on his wife. Come in. Mrs. Leonard Ball is here. Mrs. Ball. Come here. You saw that young man? He's just been arrested for murder. I know. Isn't it exciting, Sir Wilfred? Do you think he did it? Oh, no, sir. I'm sure he didn't. Oh? Why not? He's far, far too nice. That makes three of us. Bring Mrs. Vole in. And we're probably three credulous fools, taken in by a young man with a pleasing personality. Mrs. Leonard Vole. My dear Mrs. Vole. Ah, you are Mr. Mayhew. Yes. Uh, this is Sir Wilfred Robarts, who has agreed to handle your husband's case for him. How do you do, Sir Wilfred? How do you do? I have just come from your office, Mr. Mayhew. They told me you were here with my husband. Quite, quite. Just as I arrived, I thought I saw Leonard getting into a car. There were two men with him. One, a policeman. Now, my dear Mrs. Vole, you must not upset yourself. Won't you sit down here? Thank you. There is nothing to be alarmed about as yet, and you must not give way. Oh, no. I shall not give way. Then let me tell you that, as perhaps you already suspect, your husband has just been arrested. 
For the murder of Miss Emily French? I'm afraid so, yes. But please, don't be upset. You keep saying that, Sir Wilfred, but I am not upset. No, no, I can see that you have great fortitude. You can call it that, if you like. The great thing is to be calm and to tackle all this sensibly. That suits me very well. But you must not try and hide anything from me. You must not try and spare me. I want to know everything. I want to know the worst. Splendid, splendid. That's the right way to tackle things. Now, dear lady, we're not going to give way to alarm or despondency. We're going to look at things in a sensible and straightforward manner. Your husband became friendly with Miss French about six weeks ago. You were uh, aware of that friendship? He told me that he'd rescued an old lady in her parcels one day, in the middle of a crowded street. He told me that she'd asked him to go and see her. All very natural, I think. And your husband did go and see her? Yes. And they became great friends? Evidently. There was no question of your accompanying your husband on any occasion? Leonard thought it better not. He thought it better not. Yes. Just between ourselves, why did he think it better not? He thought Miss French would prefer it that way. Yes, yes, quite. Well, perhaps we can go into that some other time. Your husband then became friends with Miss French. He did her various little services. She was a lonely old woman with time on her hands, and she found your husband's companionship congenial to her. Leonard can be very charming. Yes, I'm sure he can. He felt, no doubt, it was a kindly action on his part to go and cheer up the old lady. I dare say. You, yourself, did not object at all to your husband's friendship with this old lady? I do not think I objected, no. You have, of course, perfect trust in your husband, Mrs. Vole, knowing him as well as you do. Yes, I know Leonard very well. I can't tell you how much I admire your calm and your courage, Mrs. Vole, knowing, as I do, how devoted you are to him. So, you know how devoted I am to him? Of course. But excuse me, I am a foreigner. I do not always know your English terms. But is there not a saying about knowing something of your own knowledge? You do not know that I am devoted to Leonard of your own knowledge, do you, Sir Wilfred? No, no, that is of course true. But your husband told me. Leonard told you how devoted I was to him? Of course. He spoke of your devotion in the most moving terms. Men, I often think, are very stupid. I beg your pardon. It does not matter. Please, go on. This Miss French was a woman of some considerable wealth. She had no near relations. Like many eccentric elderly ladies, she was fond of making wills. She had made several wills in her lifetime. Shortly after meeting your husband, she made a fresh will. After some small bequests, she left the whole of her fortune to your husband. Yes. You know that? I read it in the paper this evening. Quite, quite. Before reading it in the paper, you had no idea of this fact? Your husband had no idea of it? Is that what he told you? Yes. You don't suggest anything different. No. Oh, no, I do not suggest anything. There seems to be no doubt that Miss French looked on your husband rather in the light of a son or perhaps a very favourite nephew. You think Miss French looked upon Leonard as a son? Yes, I think so. Definitely. I think so. I think that could be regarded as quite natural, quite normal under the circumstances. What hypocrites you are in this country. Oh, my dear Mrs. Bow. I shock you? I'm so sorry. Of course, of course. You have a continental way of looking at these things. But I assure you, dear Mrs. Vole, that is not the line to take. It would be most unwise to suggest in any way that Miss French had any feelings for Leonard Vole other than those of a mother, or shall we say an aunt? Oh. By all means. 
let us say, an art, if you think it best. One has to think of the effect on the jury of all these things, Mrs. Vole. Yes, I also wish to do that. I have been thinking of that a good deal. Quite so. We must work together. And now we come to the evening of October the 14th. That is just over a week ago. You remember that evening? I remember it very well. Leonard Vole called on Miss French that evening. The housekeeper, Janet Mackenzie, was out. Mr. Vole played a game of double demon with Miss French and finally took leave of her around nine o'clock. He returned home on foot, he tells me, arriving at approximately 25 minutes past nine. 25 past nine. At half past nine, the housekeeper returned to the house to get something she had forgotten. Passing the sitting room door, she heard Miss French's voice in conversation with a man. She assumed that the man with Miss French was Leonard Vole, and Inspector Hearn says, that it is this statement of hers which has led to your husband's arrest. Mr. Ball, however, tells me that he has an absolute alibi for that time since he was at home with you at 9.30. That is so, is it not? He was with you at 9.30? That is what Leonard says. Said he was at home with me at 9.30? Isn't it true? But of course. Possibly the police have already questioned you on that point. Oh yes, they came to see me yesterday evening. And you said? I said, Leonard came in at 9.25 that night and did not go out again. You said, oh. That was right, was it not? What do you mean by that, Mrs. Vole? That is what Leonard wants me to say, is it not? It's the truth. You said so just now. I have to understand, to be sure, if I say yes, it is so, that Leonard was with me at 9.30. Will they acquit him? Will they let him go? If you are both speaking the truth, then they will uh, have to acquit him. But when I said that to the police, I do not think they believed me. What makes you think they did not believe you? Perhaps I did not say it very well. You know, Mrs. Vaughan, I don't quite understand your attitude in all this. So, you don't understand? Well, perhaps, perhaps it is difficult. Perhaps your husband's position is not quite clear to you. I have already said that I want to understand fully just how black the case against my husband is. I say to the police that Leonard was with me at 9.30 and they do not believe me. But perhaps there is someone who saw him leave Miss French's house, or who saw him in the street on his way home. Your husband cannot think of or remember anything helpful of that kind. So, it will only be his word and mine. And mine. Thank you. And that is what I wanted to know. But Mrs. Vole, please don't go. There is a lot more to be discussed. Not by me. Why not, Mrs. Vole? I shall have to swear, shall I not, to speak the truth and all the truth and nothing but the truth. That is the oath you take. And suppose when you ask me, when did Leonard Vole come that night, I should say... Well? There are so many things I could say. Mrs. Vole, do you love your husband? Leonard says I do. Leonard Vole believes so. But Leonard is not very clever. You are aware, Mrs. Vole, that you cannot by law be called to give testimony damaging to your husband? How very convenient. And your husband can... He is not my husband. What? Leonard Vol is not my husband. He went through a form of marriage with me in Berlin. He got me out of the Russian zone and brought me to this country. I did not tell him that I had a husband living at the time. He got you out of the Russian sector and safely to this country. You should be very grateful to him. Are you? One can get tired of gratitude. Has Leonard Vole ever injured you in any way? Injured me? He worships the ground I walk on. And you? You want to know too much. I think we must be quite clear about this. Your statements so far have been somewhat ambiguous. 
What exactly happened on the evening of October the 14th? Leonard came in at 25 minutes past nine and did not go out again. I have given him an alibi, have I not? You have. Mrs. Vaux? Yes? You're a very remarkable woman, Mrs. Vaux. And you are satisfied? I hope. I'm damned if I'm satisfied. Nor I. She's up to something, that woman. But what? I don't like it, John. She certainly hasn't had hysterics all over the place. Ha! <laughs> cool as a cucumber. What's going to happen if we put her into the witness box? God knows. The prosecution would break it down in no time. Especially if it were Myers. If it's not the Attorney General, it probably will be. Then what's your line of attack? The usual. Keep interrupting as many objections as possible. What beats me is young Vole is convinced of her devotion. Don't put your trust in that. Any woman can fool a man if she wants to, and if he's in love with her. He's in love with her, all right, and trusts her completely. More fool he. Never trust a woman. Is there no justice? We come out of a stuffy courtroom gasping for fresh air, and what do we find? Fog. It's not as thick as the fog we're in over Mrs. Halber's index. Oh, that damn woman. From the very first moment I clapped eyes on her, I scented trouble. I knew she was up to something. A thoroughly vindictive piece of goods, and far too deep for that simple young fool in the dock. But what's her game, John? What's she up to? Tell me that. Presumably, it would seem to get young Vole convicted of murder. But why? Look what he's done for her. He's probably done too much for her. And she despises him for it. That's likely enough. Ungrateful beasts, women. But why be vindictive? After all, if she was bored with him, all she had to do was walk out. There doesn't seem to be any financial reason for her to remain with him. Tea, Sir Wilfred, and a mug for Mr. Mayhew, too. Tea. Strong drink is what we need. Oh, I know how you like your tea, sir. Black and strong. How did it go today? Badly. Oh, no, sir. Oh, I do hope not, because he didn't do it. I'm sure he didn't do it. You're still sure he didn't do it? Now, why is that? Because he's not the sort. He's nice, if you know what I mean. Ever so nice. And he'd never go coshing an old lady on the head. But you'll get him off, won't you, sir? I'll get him off. God knows how. Too few women on the jury. <laughs> Evidently, the women like him. I can't think why. He's not particularly good looking. Perhaps he's got something that arouses the maternal instinct. Women want to mother him. Whereas Mrs. Harger is not the maternal type. No, she's the passionate sort, pot-blooded behind that cool self-control. The kind of a knife a man if you double-crossed her. God, how I'd like to break her down. Show up her lies. Show her up for what she is. Forgive me, Wilfred, but aren't you letting this case become a personal duel between you and her? Am I? Perhaps I am. But she's an evil woman, John. I'm convinced of that. And a young man's life depends on the outcome of that jewel. I don't think the jury liked her. No, you're right there, John. I don't think they did. To begin with, she's a foreigner. And they distrust foreigners. Then she's not married to the fellow. She's more or less admitting to committing bigamy. None of that goes down well. And at the end of the day, she's not sticking to her man when he's down. We don't like that in this country. That's all to the good. Yes, but it isn't enough. There's no corroboration of his statements whatsoever. 
He admits to being with Miss French that evening. His fingerprints are all over the place. They haven't managed to find anyone who saw him on the way home. And there's the altogether damning matter of the will. That travel agency business doesn't help. The woman makes a will in his favour and straight away he goes asking about luxury cruises. Couldn't be more unfortunate. I agree. And his explanation was hardly convincing. Mm. And yet, you know, John, my wife does it. Does what? Gets travel agencies to make out itineraries for extensive foreign tours for both of us. She'll work it all out to the last detail and bemoan the fact that the boat misses a connection in Bermuda. She could, she'll say that we could save time by flying, but we wouldn't see anything of the country. And what do I think? And I say, it's all the same to me, my dear. Arrange it as you like. We both know it's a kind of game, and we'll end up with the same old thing, staying at home. <laughs> with my wife, it's houses. Houses? Orders to view. Sometimes I think there's hardly a house in England that's ever been up for sale that she hasn't been over. She plans how to apportion the rooms and works out any structural alterations that might be necessary. She even plans the curtains and the covers and the general colour schemes. <laughs> well, the fantasies of our wives aren't evidence worse luck. But it helps one to understand why young Gold would ask him for cruise literature. Pipe dreams. There you are, John. Ah, thank you, Wilson. I think we've had a certain amount of luck with Janet Mackenzie. Bias, you mean? That's right. Overdoing her prejudice. That was a very telling point you made about her deafness. Yes, yes, we got her there. But she got her own back over the wireless. <laughs> not smoking, John? Uh, no, not just now. John, what really happened that night? Was it robbery with violence after all? The police have to admit it might have been. But they don't really think so, and they don't often make a mistake. That inspector is quite convinced that it was an inside job, that that window was tampered with from the inside. Well, he may be wrong. I wonder. But if so, who was the man Janet Mackenzie heard talking with Miss French at 9.30? Seems to me that there are two answers to that. The answers being? First, that she made the whole thing up when she saw that the police weren't satisfied about it being a burglary. Surely she wouldn't do a thing like that. Well, what did she hear then? Don't tell me it was a burglar chatting amicably with Miss French before he coshed her on the head. You old clown. That certainly seems unlikely. I don't think that that rather grim old woman would stick at making up a thing like that. I don't think she'd stick at anything, you know. No, I don't think she'd stick at anything. Good Lord, do you mean that? Yes, Carter. Excuse me, Sir Wilford. A young woman is asking to see you. She says it has to do with the case of Leonard Vole. Mental? Oh, no, Sir Wilford. I can always recognise that type. What sort of a young woman? A rather common young woman, sir, with a free way of talking. And uh, what does she want? She says she knows something what might do the prisoner a bit of good. Highly unlikely. Bring her in. Yes, sir. What do you think, John? Oh, well, we can't afford to leave any stone unturned. Young woman. Yeah, what's this? Two of ya? I ain't talking to two of ya. This is Mr. Mayhew. He's Leonard Bell's solicitor. I'm Sir Wilfred Robarts, counsel for the defence. So you are, dear. Didn't recognise you without your wig. Lovely you're looking at their wigs. Having a bit of a conflab, are ya? Well, maybe I can help ya. If you make it worth me while. You know, Miss... Uh... No need for names. If I did give you a name, mightn't be the right one. Might it? As you please. You realise that you're in duty bound to come forward to give any evidence that may be in your possession. Ah, come off it. Didn't say I knew anything, did I? I got something. That's more to the point. And what is this something that you have got, madam? I was in court today, and which said Eilig had tried to give her evidence. So I am mighty about too. She's a wicked one. A Jezzy Bell, that's what she is. Quite so. But as to the special information that you have? Ah, but what's in it for me? It's valuable what I got. Auntie quit, that's what I want. I'm afraid we could not countenance anything of that character. But perhaps if you let us know a little more about what it is that you have to offer. 
Don't buy unless you get a butcher's, is that it? Uh, butcher's? A butcher's orc! A lork! Oh, yes. I got the goods on her, alright. It's letters, that's what it is. Letters. Letters? Written by Remain Vol to the prisoner? <laughs> to the prisoner? Don't make me laugh. Poor ratty prisoner. He's been took in by her, alright. I've got something to sell, dearie. Don't you forget. If you will let us see these letters, then we'll be able to advise you as to how pertinent they are. Put in your own language, ain't ya? Well, as I say, don't expect you to buy without seeing. But fair's fair. These letters will do a trick. They get the boy off and put that foreign bitch where she belongs. Well, it's hundred quid, right? If those letters contain information that is useful for the defence, in order to... Uh, uh, assist in your expense in coming here. I'm prepared to offer you ten pounds. Ten bloody quid for letters like these? Think again. If you have a letter there that will help to prove my client's innocence, twenty pounds, I think, would not be an unreasonable sum for your expenses. Fifty quid and it's a bargain, as if you're satisfied with letters. Twenty pounds. Now, all right, Blaster. Here, take them. Quite a packet of them. Top ones are one that will do trick. Just a moment. I suppose this is her handwriting. It's her handwriting, all right. She wrote it. It's all fair and square. We have only your word for that. Just a moment. I do have a letter from Mrs. Vole. Uh, not here, but at my office. Well, madam, it looks as though we'll have to trust you for the moment. It's incredible, quite incredible. The cold-blooded vindictiveness. How did you get hold of these? That'd be telling. What have you got against Romain Ball? See ya. Oh, did she do that to you? Not her. Chap I was going with. Going with him steady I was too. He was a bit younger than me. But he was fond of me. And I loved him. And then she came along. She got hold of him and she got him away from me. She started to see him on the sly. And then one day he cleared out. Oh, I knew where he'd gone. I went after him. And I found him. Together. I told her what I thought of her. And he set on me. He wanted one of them razor gangs he was. He cut me face proper. Here he says. No man will ever get you now. Did you go to the police about it? Me? <laughs> Not likely. Besides, it wasn't his fault. Not really. It was hers. All hers. Getting him away from me, turning him against me. But I waited my time. I followed her about and I watched her. I know where another bloke uses if you go see on the slide sometimes. That's how I got old and letters. So now you know the old story, mister. Want a kiss, ducky? Don't blame you. I'm deeply sorry. Deeply sorry. You got a fiver, John? We'll make it another five pounds. Oh, now, Ommy, will ya? We'll end up another five quid. Oh, I knew I was being too soft with ya. Those letters are good, ain't they? They will, I think, be very useful. Here, John, have a butcher's at this <laughs> one. We can have a handwriting expert on these for safety's sake, and you can give evidence if necessary. We must have this man's surname, his address. Hello, where's she gone? She mustn't leave without giving us further particulars. Carter! Carter! Yes, Sir Wilbrook? Carter, where did that young woman go? She ran straight out, sir. Well, you shouldn't have let her go. Send her after her. Very good, Sir Wilfred. She's gone? Yes, I've sent Greta after her, but there's not a hope in this fog. Damn, we must have this man's surname and address. We won't get it. She's thought things out too carefully. Wouldn't give us a name and then slipped out like an eel as soon as she saw us busy with the letters. She doesn't want to appear in the witness box. Look what the man did to her last time. She'd have protection. Would she? For how long? He'd get her in the end, or at least his pals would. No, she's already risked something coming here. She doesn't want to bring the man into it. It's Romaine Halger she's after. Then what a beauty our Romaine is. But we've got something to go on at last. Now. As to procedure.
All rise. All persons who have anything further to do before my Lady, the Queen's Justices of Oye and Termina and General Jail Delivery for the jurisdiction of the Central Criminal Court, draw near and give your attendance. God save the Queen. My Lord, since this was adjourned, certain evidence of a rather startling character has come into my hands. This evidence is such that I am taking it upon myself to ask your Lordship's permission to have the last witness for the prosecution, Romain Halga, recalled. When exactly, Sir Wilfred, did this new evidence come to your knowledge? It was brought to me after the court was adjourned last night. My Lord, I must object to my learned friend's request. The case for the prosecution is closed, and I, I think Mr. Barnes, I had not intended to rule on this question without observing the customary formality of inviting your observations on the matter. Yes, Sir Wilfred. My Lord, in a case where evidence vital to the prisoner comes into the hands of his legal advisers at any time before the jury can return their verdict, I contend that such evidence is not only admissible but desirable. Happily, there is clear authority to support my proposition to be found in the case of the King against Stillman, reported in 1926 appeal cases at page 463. It isn't trouble to cite the authority, Sir Wilfred. I'm quite familiar with it. I should like to hear the prosecution. Now, Mr. Myers. My Lord, the course my learned friend supposes is except in secular circumstances, quite unprecedented. And, and what, may I ask, is this starting new evidence of, of which first book it speaks? Letters, my lord. Letters from Romain Harley. I should like to see these letters in which you refer to the My friend was good enough to tell me, only as we came into court, that he intended to make this submission. So I have had no opportunity to examine the authorities, but I think I remember a case in 1930, yes, the King against Porter, I believe. No, Mr. Myers, the King against Potter, and it was reported in 1931, and it happened I appeared for the prosecution. And if my memory serves me correctly, your Lordship's similar objection was sustained. Alas. So, Mr. Myers, your memory for once served you ill. <laughs> no, it was a, my objection then was overruled by Mr. Justice Swindon, as yours is now by me. Silence. Call Romain Halger. Romain Halger. Romain Halger. These letters were authentic at great with very serious questions. Remain high, then. You are recalled to the box so that Sir Wilfred may ask you some further questions. Mrs. Harger, do you know a certain man whose Christian name is Max? I don't know what you mean. And yet, it's a very simple question. Do you or do you not know a man called Max? Certainly not. You're quite sure of that? I've never known anyone called Max. Never. And, and yet, I believe it is a very common Christian name or contraction of a name in your country. You mean that you have never known anyone of that name? Oh, in, in Germany, yes, perhaps. I do not remember. It is a long time ago. I shall not ask you to cast your mind back such a long way as that. A few weeks will suffice. Let us say the 17th of October last. What have you got there? A letter. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm talking about a letter. A letter written on the 17th of October. You remember that date, perhaps? Not particularly. Why? I suggest that on that date, you wrote a certain letter. A letter addressed to a man called Max. I did nothing of the kind. These are lies that you're telling. I, I don't know what you mean. That letter was one of a series written to the same man over a considerable period. Lies! All lies! You would seem to have been on intimate terms with this man 
How dare you say a thing like that? It isn't true! Prisoner in his own interest will remain silent. I'm not concerned with the general trend of this correspondence. I'm only interested in one particular letter. My beloved Max, an extraordinary thing has happened. I believe all our difficulties may be ended. It's a lie! I never wrote that! How did you get hold of that letter? Who gave it to you? How the letter came into my possession is irrelevant. You stole it! You are a thief as well as a liar! Or did some woman give it to you? Yes, I am right, am I not? Kindly confine yourself to answering counsel's questions. But I will not listen. So far, you have only heard the opening phrases of this letter. Am I to understand that you definitely deny writing it? Of course I never wrote it. It is a forgery. It is an outrage that I should be forced to listen to a pack of lies. Lies made up by a jealous woman. I suggest it is you who have lied. You have lied flagrantly and persistently in this court and upon earth. And the reason why you have lied is made clear by this letter. Written by you in black and white. You are crazy! Why should I write down a lot of nonsense? Because a path had opened before you to freedom. And in planning to take that way, the fact that an innocent man would be sent to his death meant nothing to you. You have even included that final deadly touch of how you yourself managed to wound Leonard Ball with a knife. I never wrote that. I wrote that he did himself, cutting the stake. So, you know what is in this letter before I have read it. Damn you. Damn you. Damn you. Leave her alone. Don't bully her. My beloved Max, an extraordinary thing has happened. I believe all our difficulties may be ended. I can come to you without any fear of endangering the valuable work you are doing in this country. The old lady I told you about has been murdered, and I think Leonard is suspected. He was there earlier that night, and his fingerprints will be all over the place. 9.30 seems to be the time. Leonard was home by then, but his alibi depends on me on me. Supposing I say he came home much later and that he had blood on his sleeve. He did have blood on his sleeve because he cut his wrist at supper. So you see, it would all fit in. I can even say he told me he killed her. Oh, Max, beloved, tell me I can go ahead. It would be so wonderful to be free from playing the part of a loving, grateful wife. I know the cause and the party comes first. But if Leonard was convicted of murder, I could come to you safely, and we could be together for always. Your adoring Romaine. Mrs. Hilder, would you please go back to the witness box? You have, you have heard that lesson read? What have you to say? Nothing. Romain, tell him you didn't write it. I know you didn't write it. Of course, I wrote it. That, my lord, concludes the case for the defence. Uh, Sir Wilfred, have you any evidence as to whom <laughs> these letters were addressed? My lord, they came into my possession anonymously, and there has been as yet no time to ascertain any further facts. It would seem likely that he, Max, came to this country illegally and is engaged upon some subversive operations here. You will never find out who he is. Never. I don't care what you do to me. You shall never know. Mr. Miles, do you wish to agree with that? Really, my lord, I find it somewhat difficult in view of these startling developments. M Mrs. Heiger, you are, I think, of a highly nervous temperament. Being a foreigner, you may not quite realize the responsibilities that lie upon you when you take the oath in an English court of law. If you had been intimidated into admitting something that is not true, if you, if you wrote a letter under stress or in some spirit of make-believe, Mrs. Hagen, please do not hesitate to say so now. Must you go on torturing me? I wrote the letter. Now let me go. My lord, I submit that this witness is in Mr. such a state of agitation that she hardly knows what she is saying or admitting. Mr. Myers, you may remember 
that Sir Wilfred courted the witness at the time of her previous statement and impressed upon her the sacredness of the oath she had taken. Mrs. Hilda, I have to warn you that this is not the end of the matter. To commit this country, if you commit perjury, you will be called to account for it. And I tell you now that I have no doubt that proceedings for perjury will very shortly be taken against you. The sentence for perjury can be very severe. You may stand now. So, Wilson, would you now address on behalf of the defence? Members of the jury, when truth is clearly evident, it speaks for itself. No words of mine, I'm sure, can add to the impression made upon you by the straightforward story which the prisoner has told, and by the very wicked attempt to incriminate him, evidence of which you have just witnessed. Vol, stand up. Members of the jury, are you all agreed upon your verdict? We are. Do you find the prisoner, Leonard Vol, guilty or not guilty? Not guilty, my lord. Leonard Vol, you have been found not guilty of the murder of Emily Friend on October 14. You are here by this charge and the free to leave this court. All persons who have anything firm to do before my lady, the Queen's Justice's Court, may depart hence and give your attendance at 10.30 o'clock tomorrow morning. God save the Queen. Nasty mess. You hear that, John? Your troubles are over now, my boy. But it was a near thing, you know. Yes, I suppose it was. If we hadn't managed to break that woman down. But did you have to go for her the way you did? It was terrible the way she went to pieces. Now look here, Bob. You're not the first young man I've known who's been so crazy over a woman he has been blinded to what she's really like. That woman did her level best to put a rope round your neck. And don't you forget it. Yes, but why? I can't see why. She's always seemed so devoted. I could have sworn she loved me. Yet, all the time she was going with this other fellow. It's unbelievable. There's something there I don't understand. It'll be another two or three minutes, sir. Is there a crowd? Yes. We'll slip you out the side door when we bring the car around. You'd better wait in here, ma'am. The crowd's in a nasty mood. I'd let them disperse before you try to leave. Thank you. No, you don't. Are you protecting Leonard from me? Really, there's no need. You've done enough harm. May I not even congratulate Leonard on being free? No thanks to you. And Rich? Rich? Yes, I think, Mr. Vole, that you'll certainly inherit a great deal of money. Money doesn't seem to mean so much after what I've been through. Remain, I can't understand Leonard, what... I can explain. No. Tell me, do those words the judge said mean that I shall go to prison? You'll most certainly be charged with poetry and tried for it. You'll probably go to prison. I, I, I'm sure everything will come Vol, right. you never see sense. Now, we must consider practicalities. This matter of probate. It may interest you to know that I took your measure the first time we met. I made up my mind then to beat you at your little game. And by God, I've done it. I've got him off, in spite of you. In spite of me? You don't deny, do you, that you did your best to hang him? Would they have believed me if I'd said that he was at home with me that night and did not go out? Would they? Why not? 
because they would have said to themselves, this woman loves this man. She would say or do anything for him. They would have had sympathy with me, yes, but they would not have believed me. If you had been speaking the truth, they would. I wonder. I did not want their sympathy. I wanted them to dislike me, to mistrust me, to be convinced that I was a liar. And then when my lies were broken down, then they believed. So now you know the old story, mister. Want a kiss, Ducky? My God! Yes, there's a woman with the letters. I wrote those letters. I brought them to you. I was that woman. It wasn't you who won freedom for Leonard. It was I. And because of it, I shall go to prison. But that's the end of it. Leonard and I'll be together again, happy, loving each other. My dear, but could you trust me? We believe, you know, that our British system of justice upholds the truth. We'd have got him off. I couldn't risk it. You see, you thought he was innocent. Ah, and you knew he was innocent. I understand. But you do not understand at all. I knew he was guilty. <laughs> but aren't you afraid? Afraid? Of living your life with a murderer. You don't understand. We love each other. The first time I met you, I said you were a very remarkable woman. I see no reason to change my opinion. Len! Darling, you're free! Isn't it wonderful? Darling, it's been awful. I've been nearly crazy. Leonard, who is this girl? I'm Len's girl. I know all about you. You're not his wife, never have been. You're years older than him and you've just got a hold of him. And you've done your best to hang him. But that's all over now. We'll go abroad like you said, on one of those cruises. We'll have a wonderful time. Is this true? Is she your girl, Leonard? Yes. She is. After all I've done for you, what can she do that can compare with that? She's 15 years younger than you are. I've got the money. I've been acquitted. And I can't be tried again. So don't go shooting off your mouth, or you'll just get yourself hanged as an accessory after the fact. No. That will not happen. I shall not be tried as an accessory after the fact. I shall not be tried for perjury. I shall be tried for... Ah!